craftsmanship is superb, and uh, he reflects on what he does. And um, this is what I can tell you about Ralph Rucci. Um, he, uh, he has had many uh, uh, honors from uh, different sources, and I wanted to tell you a few things about his thinking. Uh, he had, uh, he's exhibited his paintings too, and many years ago he was interested, as any of you who are fashion designers should be, to go to the archives of Claire McArdle, Madame Gress, and Galanos, and Charles James. He would spend hours at the Brooklyn Museum or at the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Costume Institute to study the past. Often, I've heard it said that he is the Balenciaga of, the, of today and the future. He will go down as one of the greats of our era. And uh, I think he may be here, I hope. Um, I'm, I'm all excited, and I wish he would get here, but we'll have to forgive him. Yes? Speak louder. I can't hear you. Next week, oh, here's Mr. Rucci. We are all excited. <laughs> you told me a class. No, I said 244. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Here's the, you can remove this uh, if you want to walk. I haven't been here in so many years. Yeah, I told them you were a student here yeah. once. <laughs> so bravi. How the many of you know the work of Mr. Rucci? I'd like him to see all the hands. Good, see? so you don't have to talk about fashion. We can talk about you. Well, they want to hear that too about me. It's a pleasure to be here. Forgive me for being a bit late, but we moved our offices downtown, so coming up in traffic is a bit longer than usual. Um, you know, I love speaking, and I've been speaking often recently, and I'll get into talking about fashion and my work and all those particulars, but I think it might be nice to begin with questions, uh, anything, not even relating to design, because I'm so fascinated with process in anyone's profession. Uh, so if anyone would begin, like to begin with some questions, or how you wish for me to speak, or what you would like to hear about. Yes, my dear. Um, do you feel that there's a block Tell me again, do I feel what? Do you feel there's such a block in the future that it's Such a great question. Uh, it allows you, I studied philosophy and literature on purpose. Specifically, uh, I started off doing philosophy and fine arts because it allowed my mind to open and to be receptive to be a student, because you never stop being a student. You, you do all realize that. And that's, that's the greatest luxury, I think, in life, if we can consistently be students. I let my mind open for the possibilities that I could find, especially when I decided to enter in design seriously. I think with philosophical thought or even psychological thought, you bring a dimension of well, you bring a dimension from your research and your study into the process of fashion where you begin to research a given topic. Now, I'm not saying, as you do in your classes right now, go into the 18th century costume and look at details to bring to fashion, but maybe take something conceptual, like the idea of passion. How can you convey passion in clothes? Or quietude. How can you convey that in clothes? How can you make people think and how can you stimulate people to think and feel about clothes other than the splash that simple press wants you to feel about a garment? So there's that, the conceptual thought to apply to the process of fashion design. And then I think it's the rigor of how you research the work when you were in college, when, you were do when I was doing a paper or researching a particular topic in philosophy. So I'm very glad that I did it that way. And I think, as students, 
you'll have the opportunity to think conceptually, to always think outside of the box, because that's where you're going to find two things, something original, and I'm convinced, something deeply important about yourself. Because I think you need to see it, besides it being work in your life, as a process by which you begin to know what's inside you, emotionally and psychologically. Love that question. Anyone else? Yes, my dear. Fashion marketing and merchandising. May I ask you, all of you a question? What is fashion marketing? Could anybody talk to me about fashion marketing? You have to. Know. Somebody has to have an opinion. There's no such thing as right and wrong. I plead. Somebody tell me what fashion marketing is. I'm really curious. Yes, my dear. Love that. It's simple and clear. Do, you, do you, all of you think there are many opportunities to market fashion? I'm not a teacher. I have to pull these answers out of you. No, only because my curiosity exists in a space of do we have an American fashion industry to market? I sit back and uh, in October, I'm proud to say I'll experience my 20, oh hi. In my 25, I, we, we are having our 25th anniversary in October. And, um, and when I think about when I started, after I, when I first came to New York, there was an enormous fashion industry. And now I think we could count them on two hands. You know, a, a, a company that needs to be branded, that needs to be spoken about, that has a point of view that is in some way about building a brand, as opposed to a moment in time. So I'm fascinated by how you're studying this and what they tell you about this. How, how do you actually do it? And of course, I empathize totally with all of you that are fashion design students. Because, I don't know, I'm curious. Like, if it were more one-on-one, -on -one, I'd like to hear how you approach it, what you intend to do. Maybe this is a moment, though, to talk about me just briefly, OK, so I have an overview. I went to college in Philadelphia and I studied philosophy and literature before I, I arrived at a conclusion of what I wanted to do. And I suppose I always had this whole closet case sensibility that I did want to go into fashion design, but I didn't have the courage to actually do that because, you know, I come from a very conservative Italian family and one doesn't simply just go into fashion design. What does that mean? I'm sure all of you can relate to this idea of it's somewhat un impractical and how will I survive and the chances and all of that. And, um, I was doing a paper for a philosophy class in college, and I had already caught the disease called fashion, I suppose, and I was devouring anything I could and starting to play with fabric and starting to sketch. And of course, I mean, for fashion design students, those who say, I can't sketch anything, let go, I think, of everything that they try to teach you and start. Just start. Sketch. Try to be free. You'll find a voice on your own. And for me, uh, years later, it wasn't until I was in a position that I had to sketch, you know, 150 things before lunch that you actually create a formula that's attractive and it means something to you and it can convey something individual. Anyway, uh, and I became influ in my studies in philosophy. I was always in libraries and I I was researching fashion as if it were an academic. And I did this really intensely. I am an intense person, I suppose. And I discovered three particular fashion designers that just took my heart. I saw the work, and I was so enthralled by it because it made such a difference. And it was totally not of that moment in fashion. This was the very early 70s, like 1971 or something like that. So, excuse me. So I. Uh, began to research these fashion designers. I began to study their work, and I began to sort of think of myself as a fashion designer. I think in, in any profession, if you begin to be it, you are it. That's so important. You're not a fashion designer or a fashion merchandising director or what, whatever because you're studying it. 
you have decided already that this is part of you, and you are making it part of your essence. And remember that because that is the peace that no one can touch and take away. And really, that's something you have to put in your minds. So, I raced through college, I knew what I wanted to do, and um, in 1975, I came to New York and there was one man I wanted to work with because I had already discovered that the man that was running, his, his name was, the man that I wanted to work with, his name was Halston. Now you all know who Halston was, right? Please tell me yes. The you don't have to raise your hand, but this is uh, the great, one of the greatest geniuses that we have ever had in our profession. You really have to know that because so often the biographies that exist today talk about Studio 54 and getting high, which everybody did but it has nothing to do with the man's genius. And I personally resent when they just talk about the man as that persona. He was a genius. He fused a concept of European couture with the lightness and the necessity of simplicity in American ready-to-wear and created a style that had not existed and elevated America to a position of chic that it never had. Maybe it had the glimmers through Mame Boucher and Norrell and of course the genius in California, Jimmy Galanos, but Halston gave us a point of view. And I went there because of two things. One, the man that was running his workroom, Mr. Salvatore Cardello, do you remember Mr. Cardello? No. Okay, he's a legend. Mr. Cardello, as a boy, apprenticed in Paris at Balenciaga, and you know who that is, right? Okay, he created the dictionary. And I wanted to be there to learn technique of Balenciaga. I also admired Halston and I thought his work was tremendous. And that's how I started. I knocked on the door, totally naive, totally nervous, with a book of sketches and a portfolio. And I, th I remember it exactly and they started me in the studio. And I was taking some classes at FIT because since I went through college already, I didn't have to take academic classes here. I was taking pattern making and draping classes, which great, great fun and I adored. But I always thought outside the box and I treated my days here at FIT as if it were an atelier and if it w as if it were my workroom. I must tell you that uh, a wonderful woman, Vivian Vanata, that I met here on my first day is vice president of my company. We've been together for 27 years as almost, uh, we're not married, of course not, but, but we are, uh, we have a singular vision and when I met Viv here, she and I both decided we have to, she had to work with me. And uh, the first collections that we made were from people that I met here that helped out. So it was a beautiful time here and it was a two year period, but I was doing it back and forth with Halston. I didn't stay at Halston very long because the scene there was a scene there. Um, and I was very restless. So in, this was 1978. In 1981, I showed my first collection on my own in October and there was a little hotel, wonderful hotel on Upper Madison Avenue called the Westbury. And I did this because I couldn't get arrested, quite frankly. I, um, then we had this, wonderful building called 557th Avenue and you had everyone in there from Pauline Treasure and Mr. Bean and everybody was in that building and I couldn't get arrested. <laughs> so I was desperately emotional about trying my hands at it and I wanted to see that I, I wanted to prove to myself and I couldn't afford uh, a staff or an atelier. So I draped, designed, draped, cut and made most of the, everything of the first collection. And it was a great process and a learning process. Um, everything was on the bias and it was l'hommage to Madame Grey. And uh, that's how we started. And I think because the collection was so esoteric and so totally from left bank that that's where I began to build this particular, I think, sensibility and um, a basis for people looking at me and judging the work. And that was in 1981. Um, I can go back to a history, but I don't want to spend the, you know, th this time with you just on the history. Does anyone have any questions as I'm speaking with these topics and I'm going along with some, with some history? Don't encourage, <laughs> just like, yes, my dear. B 
be a sponge. Do everything that you just mentioned and more. Carry your little book with you so when you see something, you can either make a note, because thoughts, think conceptually, thoughts connect on your in your unconscious, and that's where you're going to work from. Don't think of what's happening in fashion. Don't think of what's happening in fashion, because as soon as you do that, and as soon as you pay attention to what's happening in fashion, it's finished. Think of developing a point of view if you can. Museums, everything you said, museums, walking, people, traveling, art galleries, music, anything could be inspiring, conversations, the way a woman acts. I think, I mean, even, I think studying women, especially women of a certain grace, allow you to think so three-dimensionally about creating, cl creating clothes. You know, it's, not, it's no longer healthy or fashionable, but when women used to smoke, think of it. It was so chic, the way they just used the cigarette to be so beguiling and sexy. So I think anything can be, a, be a, a, a inspiration. I think it's important for you to conceive yourself as a sponge. Hmm? Yes? I changed my style. I'm so curious as to hear your, what do you, th what do you see? Younger. Is it possible that perhaps since fashion has become a little bit more interested in quality, that your perception of the work has changed? Thank you, they're beautiful things, and I thank you that you said. But my point, you're absolutely right. I haven't changed my work. I've built elements within it now that evolve a certain sensibility. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. I have particular influences and in women that float in my mind that I think about. I don't design for a particular woman, but I have like this collective unconscious where I pull the girls out of my head. Oh, that's this, that's that. And many of these people are a dead or you wouldn't know of them. And I've noticed after the years, if you have these conversations and if you're making reference to certain people and they're not alive, and the younger students or people, or even editors, editors, because editors now at magazines are in their 20s. If editors don't know who you're talking about, it's almost pretentious. Do you know? N not that I can relate to and I'm not going to use any names because that would be rude, but not like the latest rap star because I have no relation with that kind of thing. But do, do you know what I mean? But if I, if I pull, say, Sauge Lamberger or Pauline de Rothschild out of a reference. So in, in adding things to the collection that have to do with, let's say, the language that I've built, but experimenting it more with it more by making it more intense, and I think out of the intensity what has happened is there's been a consciousness that the clothes have translated in a more sensual manner. Thus, it's translated into more, as you said, young. But that now gives me the opportunity to say something so important to all of you as students, and, and, and I want to make sure it's, I'm clear with this. The minute, I think, you think about what's young, what's modern, what's now, it's finished, it's dated. What's young never ages, and that is the way people think, and evolving, and being intellectual, and questioning. My biggest influences are in their 80s, and they think younger than I do. I learn from the old, and I hope you do too, because it's the only space that you can go to that's totally about experience, especially when they have a particular style. All of you must have a relative that's quite old. Tap them on the shoulder and get some opinions about what's important, what they did when they were young. There's a mind, a mind, a world of inspiration there. So I'm not a particular fan of magazines that just have to do with what's young. Because for me, what's young is, I think, not as evolved as where I try to bring the work and my clothes. I need a sip of water. Anybody have any more questions? I like that question. Thank you. It's that question was really provocative because it provoked me to also tell you about something that's happening within me. And also, as another part to your answer, 
I'm nearing 50, and that's been a very strange space for me. And I have to think about the next 35, 40 years, <laughs> hopefully. Well, n no, but how, where are the, where is the vocabulary, where are the tools that I'm building in the work now that allow me to evolve my work? You know, I had this wonderful opportunity in my life to become friendly with a great legend in our, in our business, and I'm sure you all study his work. Are all of you familiar with James Galanos? No. You better be. Legend. And my friendship with Mr. Galanos has allowed me to see how, he's 81 right now, and how one must take whatever you mean in this profession and begin to evolve it. It's so important. Not change. Like, I don't believe one season we should be in the Himalayas and the next year in the 18th century Australia and the next year in Vietnam. I think your style has to be evolved. So that's why I'm also building things in the collection. The last time I was here, does everybody know a woman? She was at Harper's Bazaar. Her name was Eve Orton. She was the fur and fabric editor under Deanna Vreeland. She's divine. Because she was the fashion director for Wong Southern Mills. She was. And I was the styling director for Wong Southern Mills. And we had some beautiful encounters, controversial together, stimulating. The chicest woman, the chicest woman in the world. Mrs. Vreeland, you know who Mrs. Vreeland was, right? Okay. Oracle, the Empress. Uh, the last time I was actually here in this room, we had Eve's memorial here when she passed away. And, and that was 1989. It was a beautiful day. Okay. Question. Oui. So when you discussed the start of the Eve's memorial, did you have any other designers in the memorial? Good question. I take where I left off. I go through the collection. I go through my ideas. I look at what was most inspiring, and what was most inspiring you put away, because you already concentrated on that. But is there anything from that cut? Because maybe if you know my work, you know that I'm obsessed with way, new ways of making clothes, and cutting clothes, and draping clothes. So I take what I felt unfinished about, what I felt, you know, you go inside and you feel the area that is unresolved, because that's the area you have to touch into. And I take that. Simultaneously, I've already given myself all sorts of concepts to start to research, and to begin to experiment with. And I begin. It's an arduous process because it used to be that I would sketch hundreds and hundreds of things, and maybe by the, I don't know, this 500th sketch, you begin to find your way. Now I find that I, it, I need a lot more time thinking and being and processing. And then when I sit down to sketch, when I sketch something, even though I say I hate it because that's just my process, I put it aside. But tomorrow when I look at it, it's usually what I begin with. And then for us, I put things into work because we begin the twelves, especially for an experimental cut, and then it might not be like this, but like that, and at the fitting, it begins to come alive, and when you see what's going to happen to a neckline or a sleeve or something, then you go back to your desk and you start to sketch because you've hit on something. And it's a process. And, and really, it's, a, it's an extraordinary process, but I haven't been able to figure out how to have a life, or really a life outside of the process when you're making a collection. Because it's such a deeply emotional vein, an, an umbilical cord, because it, you're, you're creating this, this entity that, uh, for my own particular self, I can only work with, speak and work with my assistants and Vivian, and um, I tend to shut down and go underground because I don't really want to talk to people, because the process is very personal, and it's almost as if you just want a communication with yourself and those that are focused on the same direction that you are. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm half deaf. You must be deaf. I am. That is such a lovely question. The young lady said, I come from an Italian background, and how much of that do I use in my work? <sighs> I don't know how much I use in my work, but I know how much I use in my life. 
I believe in a, in a simple moral code that you can't get anywhere without being kind, and you have to do, and you have to give to achieve anything. I believe that uh, when you experience this, and I struggled many, many, many years, you know, if I, I, it, for me it just didn't happen like that. When I mentioned I went to Halston and I was really, you know, aggressive about that. Yes, indeed, but then I started the real work of my life and began the arduous process. When you experience a difficult period and you try to stay focused, I don't know how many people, I'm not here to in any way change anyone, but I think it's very important to have a spiritual sense. I don't understand the concept of atheism, actually. And I have a, a very strong rapport with the universe, with God, and my guides. And I remind myself and bring myself back always to a space of humility, because it's the only space that you can create from and achieve anything from. So were these things installed in me from my family and my childhood, perhaps? Yes, I have a father that's very, very elegant and very centered and calm like that. But I think the other 50% is that my lived experience has shown me that what I experienced in the first 25 years in life, for example, and what I'm experiencing at this period in my life are so different that this is totally a gift from God, and I can't misuse it. And while I'm here to do something with this work, I have to make it as magnificent and unique and particular as possible. Thank, that's a beautiful question. Thank you. No one has ever asked me that question. Mm -hmm. Yes? Could you ask me just, because this ear is gone. Oh, that's what. Um, I mentioned his name. There was a man by the name of Cristobal Balenciaga. Okay. Madame Gray, because Madame Gray worked. Do we all know who Madame Gray? Okay. The, her, her sense of volume and drape, I was so inspired by. And also her nonconformity about the way she approached her work. I'm sure for the fashion design students, you know, I don't want this to be so fashion design. I want to sort of also address the marketing people or fashion merchandising, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> merchandising. Um, for those of you that are in fashion design department and you're working in your draping class, and go up a quarter of an inch here and pivot the sleeve there and do your clothes. <laughs> Madame Gray, when she first started making clothes, they didn't fit anybody because she just worked in taffeta and jersey and she just swirled it all around. And um, you have wonderful Madame Gray examples here in, in, in the museum and also you have incredible things at the other museum. Is Valerie in the room? I don't want to say the other museum's name. <laughs> so uh, it was Madame Gray and then the third one was the genius by the name of Charles James. Do all of you know who Charles James? Yeah, huh? So, those are the primary influences of my, my career. Yes? Wow. <laughs> These questions are like beacons of light. I think it's an incredible responsibility that very few take seriously and broadly. And I'll name some names, positive names. A fashion editor in chief of a magazine has the sole responsibility to set the tempo of what's happening in lifestyle. Lifestyle, not the jacket. Lifestyle, how we are living today. Where people are going, what restaurants, what's happening, what food, where they're vacationing, what their homes look like. Fashion design students, you must think about the rooms that people are living in and see the clothes in those rooms. Then think twice, does it work? Then they have to report fashion. Their eye has to be really savvy because they have to choose, not the best, because it's not about the best, but the moment, this moment, every issue, and what's particular for this moment in fashion. And then they have to hire market editors and assistant fashion directors to comb the world, the collections, so that they all have the same point of view. Now you all do realize, 
that that's a really big responsibility. And most often, the fashion editors in chief, they have advertising leaning on them because you're not covered unless you advertise. You know that. Good. And it's been like that always. Even Vreeland participated with that kind of political structure. Be it as it is, that's the way it is. There are people, you're st you can still be covered in magazines if you don't advertise. Um, I said I would name names, but I won't. It's, it would be impolite for me to name names, but there are certain f f fashion publications in the United States that I think are tremendously directional, and they, they have a, an extraordinary point of view, and they're moral. They're moral. And then there are other fashion publications that are totally immoral. Because they have to do with the self-promotion of the editors and the three or four people that are running her. Next. Yes, sir. This young man is in our studio. <laughs> They're teaching rub offs in here. Don't. I sure will. Don't. Take an F. I, I mean, I can't even discuss that. No, I really can't. I'm not a snob. But to spend time learning how to do a rub off with a piece of wax on a garment that doesn't even fit anyone is ludicrous. They teach you to do this? That's different. If somebody is giving you money as you're getting started, you just go ahead, make, but make sure, you're, no, make sure you're home and you're playing with the bias and you're cutting and you're doing and your hands are learning. Because that's different in a way. I never, I don't know how to, thank God. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to make a joke out of it. I don't want to make a joke out of it. You need to be true to yourself. I, 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 if they're spending time tra t training on how to copy something and copy it correctly, question the why and question why are we doing this if the fit, A, if the fit is not assured, and B, if someone already made their livelihood on that particular garment, period. Now, I want to tell you something. Uh, Didier Grumbach is the president of the Chambre Syndicale de Couture in Paris, and he and an attorney here in the United States, they've been working for a year now, and it's finally come together. Two weeks ago on Tuesday, they were in town, and they went to Washington to the Senate, and they met with the House of Representatives. And I couldn't be there, even though I wanted to go, but I know there was an article in the Times, I think, last week. Diane von Furstenberg, uh, I think Michael, Michael Kors went, um, Narciso Rodriguez, I don't remember who else, Ralph Lauren, somebody else. Yeah, a group of people went there to talk about the idea of plagiarism in this industry, because it's become such an accommodated process. And it takes, if they're teaching it, and if they're speaking about it, and if they're showing it, and at the Academy Awards, the largest expense of airtime in any television show is at the Academy Awards for this conveyor belt to bring you people in clothes that are borrowed, hair that's borrowed, jewels that are borrowed, because they're dressed by the stylist for a design company, and most often they're paid by that company to wear the clothes. And then an Alan Schwartz at ABS will be ripping it off the next day. I mean, it says, it just talks for itself. But I can get a little hot over this topic, so I won't. What was the first part? I don't want to talk about the rub-offs. You got the gist of that. Just being true to yourself. There's an inner alarm in all of you, if you have a conscience. That's all. Listen to the inner alarm and the inner voice, I think, and you know when you're satisfied. 
You know when you're like, oh, I can't stand this anymore. Oh, oh. Walk away, come back. If it's just an emotional process to keep you focused, that's different. But if you really feel that emptiness that it's wrong, it's wrong. Don't question yourself three times. And you get on to the next. Thank you for that question. Yes, my dear. Oh, sorry. But I don't know how to turn this off. Hold on. Hello? No. Shh. What did you say? How do I what? How do you approach the marketing side of fashion when you're really getting into the creation of the fashion you want to work for? I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask. Uh, I'll explain why. We'll just let this go to the thing, because I don't know how to use this phone, okay? Uh, I don't. Um, when I was starting out, um, <laughs> it's a nice ring, no? <laughs> I know who it is, and that's why I can't turn it off, because I want to hear the message later. Get it? <laughs> no. Um, a marketing plan. It's very important. It's really important. When I started, I didn't have the luxury of, of having a marketing plan because I had no money and I had no investors. And all I had was a particular dream and a particular point of view, and this is what I was going to do. And I feel sometimes that I'm still back in 1980 planning that because I haven't left that sensibility. What I have done in terms of marketing is I allowed myself to look into my life process and I see that that's the marketing vehicle. Meaning, I used to advertise and I chose publications that were off the beaten track, like I think the most influential and the most wonderful is Italian Vogue. And I would advertise in Italian Vogue or I did once in W, but that's not really my taste. But I stayed out of the mainstream. Now, I didn't choose to stay out of the mainstream. I wasn't permitted in, unfortunately, but that's how it went in my life. So by not being in, my lived experience was how do you figure out this work in this life outside of the box? If you're having a show and no one shows up, do you stop doing shows? No. You continue even if there are four people in the audience, because your work and the worth of your work has nothing to do with who is looking at. The only conscious decision I made to have a marketing plan was five years ago when we were growing the Ready to Wear collection tremendously, and I did that almost individually and alone because I make these rather expensive clothes, and you just don't get an audience to write these types of checks for your clothes. It takes traveling across the country at trunk shows, developing the clientele, and then consistently shipping something that's made impeccably, and this is really very important, that fits. It means nothing <coughs> if it's on the runway. And it can't mesh into a person's, a woman's life and fit properly. It's meaningless. So I developed that. The ready world was growing, and then I didn't feel like the work was being received or seen by editors and people that I thought were important. So that combined with the fact that I had this enormous desire to really test myself. I always give myself more and more challenges, even though sometimes my staff is berserk over that. And I wanted to show a couture, I wanted to make a couture collection. Even though we always made couture, I wanted to make a couture and show it in Paris. And I decided by doing that, even though it was outlandish, it was almost impossible, it was financially insane, but to do this, we would open the door and have a perspective of an international market that is a little more, well, let's just say a little less provincial than depending upon the five editors in chief that have to come and look at the work and judge me. In a way, I said, no, for my life, be that I, don't change them. Change the way I'm doing it. So that was the only marketing plan I ever gave myself. But it's provoking that you ask me that, because right now, we're not doing a marketing plan. We're doing a five-year plan for the next five years based upon uh, my sense of mortality. 
<laughs> no, it's I'm not being morbid. It's just I, we need to do this now. Yes. Is it time to yes? Good question. Yeah, good question. Um, it's very important to know who's criticizing you. And it's very important to keep a broad mind and not put your ego in the middle of it. I will call a, cr okay. There are people that say things and critique the work and sometimes are downright critical and mean, some, no, never mean. I'll, I'll mention her name. There's a woman in journalism that I love very much, and she's also a friend. Her name is Kathy Horn, and she writes for the New York Times. You all know who Kathy is, right? Okay. And Kathy doesn't come from a point of view that destroys, that's destructive, that's bitchy, that's negative. Kathy comes from a point of view that's instructional. And we're friends, so I don't speak to Kathy the day of the show. I don't speak to her until... I show always on Friday. I don't speak to her on Saturday. On Sunday, I'll give her a call at home and say, you know, talk to me. And she will, because that criticism has to do with, it's constructive, because it comes from a point of view of respect, and she understands the course of my career. Then there's another organization that has been consistently writing reviews since 1981 that are just pathetic. And it wasn't until I found out how they really worked that I was able to put them in perspective. So what I'm saying is I give you two complete opposites. Know your critics and be really, I think, enthusiastic about learning from the criticism. And there's some extraordinary critics. Because they're not for Susie Menkes, International Herald Tribune. Susie has seen every important collection for the last 35 years everywhere. Couture, ready to wear, Milan, Paris, everywhere. So when Susie talks about the work, listen to her. Do you, you know? Yes. No. Never did. Yes. Uh, I needed to find a space that I consist consistently go back into of strength. Because there were so many times I just wanted to say, this is insane, give up. Take a drug, get high, not deal with it. But I didn't, and I just consistently went back to a space of saying it has to be this way, my hard-headed yell, and uh, pray. Get some strength from spiritual sources, it's very important. And it's a really intense concept, but you have to, so I think about in any walk of life, those that are, sit, that are positioned to judge you aren't your judges. So, I mean, getting back to a critic idea, if you are, if you, if, if, if you have a point of view, and you're able to marry that with some technical ability, and you're able to marry that with some wonderful thing called a supportive group of people to assist you, staff, then there's a, plan, there's a place for you and there's a plan for you. And critics come and go. They can't stop you. So I think a space, finding a space of strength within yourself is the most important thing. Yes. Here, take the microphone. Artists? Artists? Oh, I love that question. Uh, Cy Twombly, Robert Motherwell, Antonio Tapies, Joseph Boyce, uh, right now Adolf Gottlieb and Odd Reinhardt. Mostly American expre uh, 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 abstract expressionists, Franz Klein. But then uh, my sensibility is also very Asian, so I bring in lots of influences from Japan and, and from China. And I have to ask you Yes. I'm Yes, oh, thank you, Professor. The Renaissance I always pull from, yeah. 
the Renaissance is the most, I think the Renaissance as, as fashion design students and, and merchandising people, you need to really always look at it and study it, the fabrications, the way clothes were made and the cuts, extraordinary. Is it time for me to go back to, to history? A little bit, okay. Um, how much time do we have, until six? When you get bored, let me know. You Just say, important no, to important. Can you imagine the concept when fashion designers hold themselves as being really important? Something's wrong. Yes. Shh. <laughs> we will not be discussing that. I'm honored and I'm proud, but we're not discussing it because I have too much to do. <laughs> Thank you, though, and I'm honored. Um, I left you off with talking about when I was starting, and um, so we developed this business, and we're working. And I was working out of a one-room studio apartment in the East 70s, and I had. I worked alone. It was impossible. It was just insane. And we began shipping out of there, believe it or not. And then, in fashion, we had specialty stores all over the country that made a difference. Imagine if you had stores smaller, but of the same caliber and integrity of a Bergdorf Goodman. You had these all over the country. They're no longer in business, if you could believe that, in the last 25 years. You know, it's incredible. Everybody died or went out of business because fashion didn't change. Sensibility changed, the way women present themselves, you know? And even young people, you need to talk to me because I need to learn something about this. Saturday night, I went to see Sandra Bernhardt. You know, everybody knows the comedian Sandra Bernhardt. And this is Sandra's first show in New York City in a, in a long time. And I thought, you know, everybody was going to be there and you dress for something. I didn't wear a dinner suit, but I couldn't believe, where are you all going? Get back in here. <laughs> I couldn't believe that people were showing up to see Sandra Bernhardt the way they were. It's fine to be casual, but there's a time and a place for it. Presenting, dressing is presenting yourself as a unique individual, not with six hats, you know, and at the same time, it shows respect for the people that you're seeing. And if you want to be treated in a certain way, then your appearance has to be taken seriously. What has happened in the United States, and I say specifically in the United States, because you rarely see this kind of thing else in Europe, not so, I mean, not so much as the United States, but this, well, you know what it is. I don't have to use adjectives that are strong, you know. Think of the last time you were in an airport. So, I was going to say, tell me, why is this happening? Does anybody understand why this is happening? Where it's also accepted. Yes, thank you. Good point. But when we first came to New York, we didn't even have $5. You know, the first, when I first got to New York, and I, um, I didn't have a penny, and I didn't have an apartment, and, and I was older than the young people that were coming into FIT, but I begged them, I said, I have nowhere to live. So I lived for one semester in this dorm across the street. And I don't know, I mean, we were, nobody had any money, but you pulled on a black t-shirt, and you pulled it together, and you went to Studio 54. It has nothing to do with money. Never confuse money with style and taste. Never. Yes. No, wait, wait, wait. yes. It's really important from people, young people coming from a point of view that has to do with the artifice of how you present yourself that you think about this and you try to make a difference. Yes? I'm disconnecting a little bit there. 
What do you mean by showing respect for your teachers? Where were you in Spain, may I ask? Okay. Because Spain is a perfect example, I think, of an of a extraordinary Spain, I mean, Madrid and Barcelona, where, it's, yeah, where there's, there's such young communities, but they always look so incredible. Everybody's so sexy, you just faint. Yeah. I don't know. I suppose there are no answers to this kind of question, but it's good to provoke thought. Yes. But you could have both. Yeah. Yes. Are the Olsen twins those two blonde girls with the big eyes like that? Where did they come from? <laughs> hey, wait, what do they do? What, what they're actresses? The what mess? Full house. I think you said full mess, I agree. <laughs> Beautifully put also. And also, consider that we, what I said before, where is our industry? It's all leaving the, the country, and as merchandising students and design students, when you walk through the stores, the clothes are so outrageously expensive for what they are. So there's such a disproportion, but I think what you said is correct. Thank you. One of a kind. That's impossible today. Well, you can't when you're first when you're starting out. I mean, when, when you're starting out, let I me mean, let's talk about this. when you're starting out. If one is lucky enough to have family to help out, or an investor to help out, or a lover to help out, or a boyfriend, or whatever, that's different. So then you can do what you would like to do, but you need to have a plan. And perhaps before you show the collection, you need to have at least an account in place. And maybe, maybe, maybe one position with press. But as everyone will begin when you're finished to begin approaching the industry. Now, there are fashion design majors that are going to be in children's wear and in ski wear and active wear and all of that. So there's so many opportunities. So maybe what we're talking about is saying a design house. You have to start somewhere. If you take these great principle, principles with you, you have to work within the formula so you can gain some experience. But what I'm suggesting today is don't allow the principles to be taken from you. Keep them. They can't be taken. Gain experience. And then when you are able to branch out or have another position that allows you more creativity, and also while you're working, after you begin working, never leave the idea of going home in the evening and creating. So that when you're, pre you're prepared then, when you have the opportunity of a certain position. But to begin thinking as you leave school that there are no possibilities and such finite perimeters to what you can achieve is, I don't think, a very, is not the positive way to, to, to approach it. And I have a dear, dear friend who taught me something, and I work with it every day. If you vibrate 
at a higher level, those that cannot vibrate on your level leave you. Then what happens when you're vibrating at that higher level, people assume that height. People try and attempt to communicate with you on that level. And it's really quite extraordinary. And begin doing it in your own. It's an, it's an interesting couple. You go, what, what does he mean by that? It's interesting. Try it simply. You have a boyfriend. You had a fight with him. Don't get angry. Don't, have, don't get mad. Think differently. Act differently. Act more composed. Think and live in a certain way. And that person will change their attitude. It could be a classmate. It could be a friend. It could be a relative or a parent. And it's a, it's, a, it's a study, and it's a way in which I think living um, can improve. Yeah. No, because I never saw myself defined by either one. I saw myself having the opportunity to be able to learn. And when I, when I did make the decision that I was going into fashion design, I never looked back. I keep on being pulled into this world of shrink. I mean, God knows if I'm not a designer, I'm a shrink in my office. But, and I wish I could share an experience that happened this morning, that's why I'm late. I had such a story today that's so crazy, you wouldn't believe it. But anyway, try not to define yourself by just one thing. You're a composite of everything. And you're a composite of lots of other things psychologically that comes from history, family, neuroses, so many other things. Yes. You're coming up here. This lady is carrying the whole thing. <laughs> no, it was a mouse. It was a mouse. <laughs> yeah, you mean you have to laugh. When they're really tense during collection, because you know they're working 18 hours days and everything, my assistants are so insane. I mean, I'll walk in and we're all stressed out, and they'll all have wigs on their head, insane wigs. And they're all working in wigs. Yeah, th yes, you have to have a sense of humor. The idea of, you know, the atelier being hushed au main, you, it's wonderful it could be, but I have really creative, brilliant, talented people around me, so they need some releases. So yes, you have to have some fun. And about taking myself seriously, I do. I do take myself seriously, but I do become manic a lot. Yes? Well, you can understand that I can't really comment on that because it's part of the process of me. It's better if other people discuss that. But everything I've been talking about today is not about fashion design, but I'm convinced it's about living a certain way and trying to get to another level of enlightenment. And because I happen to spend my days being a fashion designer, there's a fallout from, I think, trying to be uh, a little more spiritual and a little more willing to be open. That's why I said earlier, somewhat sarcastically, and I don't want you to get the idea that I'm a snob about this, but we've had a disproportionate occurrence where a fashion designer is almost seen as an emissary to a head of state. And a fashion designer takes themselves so seriously that a proclamation of a garment is earth-shattering, or is, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And this is created by marketing and PR departments, because consider the last person to do something totally earth-shaking, totally, the last vocabulary to be given, and I mentioned it's Balenciaga. There has been no other vocabulary. Can anybody tell me, do you think there's been another vocabulary that's been as original, independent, and timeless? I mean, I would really be willing to, Maybe there was a group of people that were, maybe they were extraterrestrials and they came here to teach us. Balenciaga, Gray, Charles James, Roberto Capucci. Right? Roberto Capucci. Do you all know who Roberto Capucci is? He's still alive, you have to know. Jimmy Galanos should be in that group. Coco Chanel, right? 
So, I mean, these are the geniuses that gave us vocabulary. And if we touch, if all of us as fashion designers, if we touch and come close to a little bit of what they've done, that's success. Not, hello, darling. No. I'm really passionate about that piece because there needs to be more of a balance. Thank you for asking that question. Any more questions? Uh, we could take yes, sir. Seven. No, I could talk. I'm scheduled until six. If you want to be here, I'm scheduled until six. Do you have class at UB? You could stay. Skip class. Skip class. That's this is the first time in my whole great. life that I said yes, I would this come and talk. This is more important. Not that I'm such a, not, just because I don't have the time. So I wanted to make the time today. But I want you to really pick my brain. You're all being such dilettante polite. Ask me some questions. Here she comes. She asked me the visceral ones. I have to duck. It is. It's great. It expresses an individual perception of a part of our culture. It looks great on the people that wear it, most of the people that wear it. What I do have a problem with is the use of lycra in many garments. I've said this once in an interview and they quoted this and I love it though, it just came out. Lycra is a privilege. <laughs> lycra is a privilege. Um, and I always said, there's nothing between the couture and gap. Do you know because the idea of just like moderate has become so expensive that casual clothes, when put together beautifully, inexpensive clothes, are so perfect because they're so simple. So yes, I don't have this kind of like a snobism about, and I buy clothes like that. I mean, I love Gap, t-shirts and things, jeans. But who? You talk about what? Oh, right. It is. I think it's a part. And perhaps there should be a segment that devotes itself to of the moment trends, and you include hip hop clothes, Sean John. Um, I mean, there was a moment when that company, Tommy Helfinger, borrowed on that culture, and now when it didn't work for them, they went into sort of Americana via Ralph Lauren, or what David Chewett Nautica did with that American sensibility. So there should be a group, or, or goth, or punk. I mean, these are all, I think, subcategories within fashion that have to do with groups and style. And you could, you know, it could be a fascinating class. You could even examine the mafia and the way they dress. And now The Sopranos being a great success on television, I'm sure it's made it very approachable and acceptable for young people in neighborhoods like that to wear Banlon polo shirts with, you know, gold bracelets, gold watches, you, you, you know? So how do I feel about it? I think it should be discussed and talked about, you know? And I, um, this is just my personal opinion. It's not on the same level as design houses that show a collection with a point of view, but it's equally as valid because it's, it is dressing people that want to begin to experiment with style and their own personalities. Hello? Mr. Ruti? Yes. Is there a question? I'm here until 6. Would you raise your hand? Yes, sir. I heard the first, men's collection, what was the second? Good questions. I'll address the second one first. A long time ago, I realized my limitations, and I don't have the particular talent or aptitude to know how most people want to look. I just don't. Would I like to maybe, but I think it's perfectly done already. Great t-shirts. Levi Strauss, you cannot touch the fit. It is couture of jean, and it's $40. The idea of spending $250 on a pair of jeans, I think, is insane. No, 
Everybody buys Levi Strauss and rubs them off. Everybody. And they just change this, they change the drop, they change this. So um, I wouldn't attempt that. Also, I couldn't attempt that because you're, you're almost not allowed to change your market so much because what happens is you might lose an important core of the secret membership that buys your clothes in a way. And as I said, and I am passionate about this, I don't have a particular talent for that. If I do casual clothes, it's a luxury fabric. You see, not that I dress like that all the time. The second, the first part of your question, yes, I can't wait to do menswear, and I've had so many requests, and there, there's just not just requests from people. You know, I'm primarily with Neiman Marcus across the country, and the Spirit of Goodman, and they're willing to do shops around it and all of that, but. I don't believe, after my lived experience, that I should start this until we know we can ship the clothes significantly. Because it will be the same concept as the women's wear. Great cuts, luxury fabrics, and you need the production facilities for that. Because it's very important for you to know that in dressmaking and making clothes for women, those hands cannot successfully tailor and make clothes for men. You need hands that are trained for a man's shoulder and a chest and an armhole, and you need to tailor them in a different way so that the look is strong. And um, I, honestly, I haven't found production facilities, and I've tried Normandy, and I've tried two areas in Italy that have satisfied me. So it's going to be some time, because I'm not going to start, and then I have to hire also a staff for that, sales and all of that. Because if I start something, I don't want to stop it in two years. I want it to go on. Yes. Thank you, dear. Oh, you're welcome. Go ahead, go right to that. Uh, two ways. I would look in women's wear every day and I would ask everybody and call fabric suppliers and just do it. And if I saw there was a blouse collection that needed somebody, I would go to any interview and take anything. And. Um, I did. A blouse collection here, a skirt collection. I remember in 1985 when, um, remember that show Dynasty that was on television? And th those two ladies were getting licensees for everything from Q-tips to mascara. And I uh, was hired as the ghost to go to Austria and design Joan Collins' as a, a millinery collection, which was a joke and a half. But I, I, I would take anything I got. And then, besides that, I always kept the couture. So this meant that, through introduction, someone heard, oh, I know of him, he can make a dress for you or a suit or something. I would meet with these individuals. I would try to polish myself because I was totally, I would usually walk to the appointments because I didn't have subway tokens. And no one knew, never let them know that truth. And I would meet clients in their homes, discuss what they would like, be a little teeny bit aloof because they need to buy into that, the fact that you don't need anything from them. And then I would sell a garment, make the toile myself, make the pattern, sew the muslin, fit it on them, take it apart, make the corrections, make the soft paper pattern, cut the garment, go buy the fabric, get the fabric, bring it uptown, cut it, and then I would bring it because I never felt so confident by making like every single garment, because it had to be perfect, perfect. Um, and I would meet my sa sample makers on subway platforms or in the lobby of their buildings or so on, and that's how I started. And we're going to have, someone mentioned it earlier, we're going to have this exhibit next year across the street at, in, in the galleries, and right now we're in the process of locating so many of those garments from 1978 and 1979 that, that um, Sometimes we see something on, on eBay and we buy it back immediately because it's fascinating for me because I, could, I would put the same, and I have, take a garment from 1979 and cut it and make it new and put it in the collection. And it's just to see the difference. What, the difference for me is what's going on underneath the garment. I've learned so much more about construction, which is so important, and how you have to make clothes, finishes. But I'm digressing, yes. What did I base my fees on? My rent. I'm not kidding you. 
I needed to pay my rent. So I usually make the government double the rent so that I had at least two months paid of rent. We have, we have receipts, because I was totally neurotic about keeping records. We have receipts from 1978, and a couture garment, a couture garment like that, at one point, when I just needed to sell something, was $2,000. Isn't that something? Today we can't make a couture garment for, oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. Certainly, I would love to. Um, so often, because of the type of work that I do and what I'm looking for, coach, <laughs> uh, especially today, you, you go to fabric mills and you look at the collections, and the industry, the world has so changed that they cannot develop luxury fabrics across the board. The bulk of the collection has to be commercially viable. So they can sell, you know, 300,000 yards to Prada of simple flannel and gabardine to Gucci and all that sort of thing. So I go to certain mills that I always work with and I give them projects. Can we make this cashmere with a rubber finish? Can we do this? Can we do that? So we, we create fabrics. And since I've been working with so many mills for such a long period of time, they love experimenting, they love the challenge, they love to be brought up to another vibration. And what happens is, if I only buy 500 meters of something, well, next year they'll put it on the collection, and if it's distributed internationally, they'll sell 300,000 meters. So, and it's fine as long as I show it first and ship it first. That, and then also uh, all of my artwork that we create into prints are made by one mill in Como. Um, and I'll tell you something else that happened in the past couple of years. You, you, know, you know the House of Lesage in Paris for embroidery. Hmm? Okay. About five years ago, the, the company of Chanel purchased Lesage, Le Marier. They do all the feather work. And that was the original company that made the camellias, the silk camellias for Chanel when she was still alive. It's called Le Marier. And then another company called Massaro. They make shoes, La Place Vendôme. And Chanel bought all of these companies, infused them with capital, but owned them and managed them. And what happened was, the prices shot up four times the amount. So previously, for couture, and, and I remember like nine years ago, we were able to use Lesage and ready to wear. But you can today. I mean, a dress that was first cost for couture, this is. A beaded dress from Lesage that might have been six years ago, $12,000. That same dress today could be $70,000, first cost, before you bring it through customs, before you do anything. So what I've begun doing in our workrooms bringing in young people and coming up with techniques that we could do it en masse. Tattering of chiffon, creating chiffon and tool and, and organza motifs, layering them. Um, and we've created fabrications within the, the, our, our own workroom. And it's really gratifying because what this does, it, it makes the workroom so confident and it's very creative. Thank you. I promise you, I said I would be here till six, and I'm not leaving. <laughs> Unless you're bored stiff. Yes. Uh, they want to come up and say hello to you and they didn't. No. <laughs> one by one, you can say hello like this. Yes. Who? Who told you that? <laughs> you, it, you must teach me. Tell me what they're saying about couture, that it's finished, dead? As long as there are corner dressmakers in Kentucky, in Idaho, in Los Angeles, there will always be couture. As long as you know how to sew, there's couture. Couture has nothing to do with doing a spectacle on a runway to sell nail polish. Nothing. It's those editors that you were talking about earlier that confused it all, and made it seem that because they have to sell advertising pages. Couture is a rigor and a technique that has to do with how you live. It's a house. House, people can't, couturiers cannot be fired or dismissed and then someone else hired and continue to have a couture house. A couture is the combination, the dialogue, the unseen and unheard dialogue between the designer and his atelier. Everybody working on the same accord. I'm, I'm, you, you really need to get that and they should be talking about that in school. 
Couture is not a spectacle to sell nail polish. And Couture is not dead. You have had many, many houses, God bless you, you've had many houses close in Paris. It's because the economics, the clientele, and perhaps let's look at the point of view they've taken. Why, why would a Chanel Couture collection be profitable when clothing begins at 62,000 euros? And most often with embroideries, the clothes are more like 178 to 200, 300,000 euros and they can't keep the clients at bay because it's the greatest atelier in the world and you have an even greater genius overseeing it all. Karl Lagerfeld. You know? So Couture is not dead. Yes. yes. Of course, Dora. I think it's very important. Thank, Thank you. you. It never left. Okay. It never left. Okay. It left en masse. It's very important what Professor just said. Not just the ceremony, but it's the way you want to be perceived. Um, it's an idea of respect. It's an idea yes. of presenting yourself as an individual. It has nothing to do with money. No, it really has nothing to do with money. And I don't, I don't know what happened. I think, you know what, I think I spent so many years in my, my, my work and so on, and I'm, you know, I'm in the East Coast or the West Coast, or I go to Europe and I just worked. And, uh, and I'm not in a rarefied circle. I'm not. I, uh, I, and I, I, I see what you see, and I, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, I think so. I, I, mean, I don't think it's, it, one should have the idea that wearing jeans is a taboo or no, t-shirts. No. It's not. No, it's not about that. It's about the whole essence. I wish we could go collectively right now to, say, an airport and just sit there and say, look, yeah. look, 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 look. <laughs> yes. There's one question here. This, I've already oh, pointed this. Here. We'll get right back. Sister. No, my sister actually. She lived in Italy for fifteen. She lived in Italy for fifteen years, and and she came to New, back to New York about two years ago. And she works in the company. She oversees um, distribution and shipping to the stores. Um, yeah, very attractive, very wonderful woman in her heart. Uh, but no, she's not involved in the design process, and I don't. No, no, no. Well, that's a good question because I don't ask many people their opinions. In terms of the studio, I only ask opinions from four people. Vivian, because she's been with me since FIT days. My assistant that handles flu, her name is Anne, Anna Rita. Christine, who does the first 12 for Taya, for coats and suits, anything tailored. So I'll ask those three opinions. And then there's a young lady in the studio that's there because she's just a genius and she has a style. Her name is Samantha. So I ask four opinions in the studio.
You mean starting a couture business as opposed to a ready-to-wear business? I'm not quite sure what the question is. This is what I, yes, I understand now. This is what I would recommend. You can do couture quality workmanship and work, but you won't make money when you're starting out. And you won't, making money is not the right concept. You won't be able to exist and continue if you make it one-on-one. -on -one. Because you won't be able to get enough clients initially to build such a business so you can continue. It's better if you put all of that passion and energy and talent into making the clothes. They could be couture workmanship, and then approaching a Bergdorf Goodman, a Neiman Marcus, a Saks Fifth Avenue, a Barneys. Because we as the designers understand, like so often, I will make a couture garment, but I won't put it in the couture, I'll put it in the ready to wear. I will take less, I'll take a bit of a loss, but I know if we're going to make 25 of them in the couture, it, I mean, if they're ready to wear, it'll balance out because the couture, you can only sell one per country. Because if a woman is spending that cost on a garment, you cannot sell two in the same city. So today, and this is, I think this is important information I can give fashion design majors, there is an enormous desire and need for high quality merchandise. And the stores that I just mentioned almost have open books to write checks to prepay for merchandise. If they like what you are doing, if they really like and they like what they're getting from you, the essence, I mean, this is not just a blanket statement that you're gonna have four samples and they're gonna buy them, no. You have to, you have to bring them into your, your, your essence, yourself. And if you explain, once you say they like the clothes, can you give me something up front to develop it? The stores will work with you because the stores don't know what to do because we don't have an industry anymore. I'm going to offer an example. Do you all go on that thing called uh, style.com and look at the collections and everything? Okay. Two young girls showed a collection last season. I never knew, I didn't know who they were. They have a label by the name of Rodarte. Do you know who they are? What? Yeah. You know them. Well, very difficult brought these girls to see me, and they were like, oh, and all of this. And I saw their work, and it's outstanding. It's feminine, it's light, its application is beautiful, and they, they're young girls that want to make couture clothes, and they're doing it, and they're selling it. They have an exclusive relationship, I believe, with Bergdorf Goodman, and I know that it's doing quite well, and they're lovely. And I'm offering that as an example, because if you have a point of view, and it's made beautifully, Stories will support you. I don't want to be an anarchist or, or somebody that's you know, anti what you're being taught here. But your professors can only take you to this certain point because what's happening is so changing. And sometimes, because they don't want your hearts to be broken, they don't want to steer you in a direction that you might break your hearts. But I think it's very important to have your heart broken over and over again. Yeah. Yes, my dear. Yes. That's such a nice question. Thank you. Um, the idea of success I take differently because I still struggle doesn't come easy. When I start a collection, I hate it. I wonder if it's going to be finished the way I want it. It's fearful for me. Uh, I want to find what I, have to be f what I have to find. That's what I always say. So the growth of the business is doing wonderfully, but you need to meet that growth with the right financial picture and support. And so I work, I must tell you, I work 75% of my time between collections on just the business. What success is, I think, is really getting that simple fact that I'm allowed to be doing this with my life. And if I influence four people in this room, that's the measure of success. Not a table at a restaurant or an invitation to a certain event. Now, in terms of how I live it, when I try to separate the anxiety and the worries, because I'm trying to get better at this, but I worry about everything, 
I begin my day at home, and it's so wonderful to, to know that I'm going to that office, and I can do this. And I happen to have a partner that always reminds me of this, so it just makes it very pl pleasant. I just wish I could disconnect the anxiety from the whole picture. <laughs> Anybody else? I am dying to do things for the home. And we began discussions, but, and I'm, I'm fascinated about what's going on, because th consider it, designers, think of it a favorite designer that you might have. They really do have, it, have not entered the home category, because home products at a certain high caliber level, you can't get licensees with licensee divisions to enter a high, high level of quality because they don't exist. And these companies that want to say, uh, sign licensees want volume-oriented pro products. So it's difficult, and, and you find that if you want the most beautiful bedding, you go to a couple of different shops. Everybody has their own boutiques. So we're trying to figure out how we can fit into the home category in our own way and I go to Europe in the beginning, middle of May, and I'm going to meet with some factories so we can do our own development um, and start to experiment with it. So that's what's in front of me right now that I'm excited about. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Good question. Um, it's important to choose a magazine. I'll do this this way. It's important to choose a magazine that in some way reflects your own sensibility. The magazine might not be mainstream. There's a great magazine I think all of you should look at. It's called Arud, A-R-U-D-E, by Ike Ude. Ike is a, a brilliant man. And I advertise in Ike's publication because I want to support his vision. Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm a guest interviewer, which is lots of fun. I get to ask people questions. But in terms of the mainstream American, let's do American first. In terms of the mainstream American magazines, I don't advertise. I don't want to on purpose. Even if I had that budget, I don't think I would. Because with what I do, I need to focus right now on using those dollars in a more, I think, intelligent way, contemplative way, as opposed to just paying into advertising space. And I find that it's very important for editors to include the work. If they don't include the work in the magazines, you know, I can't get involved in that because that's, another, that's a different world. In terms of European publications, I, I think they're far more superior in an individual point of view than American publications. And I don't think it has to do with their editors. Because, well, like is Karine, well, it's interesting, like Karine Rothfeld, she is the editor in chief of French Vogue, and Sozani at Italian Vogue are very similar in sensibilities. And the magazines were created so that they could be so fantastic. In America, there needs to be more of a practical point of view. Um, how am I answering your question? I, it's always been this age-old thing about Europe and America and what's more inspirational in terms of the publications. Clearly we know an Italian Vogue is so much more directional than another publication from America. Yeah. 